What's that? Seriously? <laughs> <laughs> Alright, that's a little bit better. So my goal for today is like, I have like 75 minutes, I was told, but I'm going to run behind that, that's for sure, because I always run behind schedule. And I always extremely fast, so please get used to it because, uh, because we have lots of slides to go through. But my goal for today is to convince those of you who did not join the workshop, yeah, to join. I'm kidding. Sorry, sorry, bad joke. All right. So, all right, so I'm really happy to be here in Tallinn. For whatever reason, I always end up in Vilnius and I always end up in Riga. Hello, Riga. Um, but I never end up in Tallinn, so it's really great to be here. And the old town is amazing. I, I mean, I shouldn't be saying that, but I actually used two hours of the conference to explore the city. It's amazing. Um, so I really liked it. So it's really great to be here. But we're not going to talk about that today. We are going to talk <coughs> about responsive design, I guess. So how many of you design in a responsive fashion by default? So you have a new project and it's probably going to be responsive by default, right? How many of you find it easy? Too many people, that's not okay. <laughs> All right. So for me personally, it's somewhere between really difficult and manageable, right? Sometimes I feel like responsive design is totally out of control, right? Which is why I kind of really it makes, me, it makes it kind of difficult for me to really be fast in responsive design. So my workflow is, I tend to think, quite efficient, but it took me quite a while to figure it out, right? To really get to results fast takes time. Oh, right, so this is me. This is how it used to look like back in the day. Things do change over time. Um, I'm still editing lots of articles on Smashing, but I also do a lot of consulting these days. So most time I spend doing front-end work, performance work, or UX work, specifically related to responsive projects. And most of the things I learn actually get into these talks or into these workshops which I run, right? Which is why they're really practical. So for me, it's really important not to talk about smashing, but actually to talk about all of those practical techniques you can apply to your projects right away, right? In fact, when you think about the web, right? When you think about the browser, this is how we as designers see the web, right? Oh, actually, to be precise, we see it more like this. Right? Because we see rectangles everywhere. So the entire web exists out of rectangles. And we as you know, web developers are pushing pixels to ensure that we create a system that scales up and down. But I really dislike the fact that we tend to think a lot in rectangles. Now this is what we kind of see the responsive design being today. Right? And I think it's fundamentally wrong. Because it's not just a set of boxes. Right? It's not just a set of layouts. It's much more difficult than that. Right? In fact, if you think about all of those boxes, they don't communicate much about the user experience, don't communicate much about the performance, nothing about interaction design. Right? It's just basically static mockups. This is not good enough. We have to get better than that. In fact, this talk is not about boxes. It's not about trends. I really don't care about trends, like things like parallax or you know, off-canvas navigation. You can use it, but you don't have to use it. Right? Um, it's also not about frameworks. I really don't care about frameworks. It's all about uh, everybody chooses their own tools. For me, it's more important to talk about techniques, patterns, solutions, and crazy experiments. Things that are really weird at times, crazy maybe, but you can apply to your work. Not it's necessarily one one, right? But you can build on top of that, which I think is really, really important. Which kind of brings me back to this idea of design patterns, right? I think it's really important to think about design patterns when we start designing, because they can speed up the workflow a lot. Um, however, design patterns have this bad reputation in the community. It's like off-the-shelf components you take and you apply, and it's like laser solution, right? It's not particularly cool these days. In fact, if you think about it, we tend to think about those design patterns as rules, right? Things that are just exist, like in an old book or guide, right? They are almost like, you know, tenants you shall not define the line height in pixels, right? because you're not supposed to do this. Right? Or you should not base your breakpoints on device sizes. Right? Or you should not take the name of the world's performance in vain. Right? Performance is important, performance matters, but don't talk about performance if you're not performant enough. Right? We tend to live by these rules, and they are really restrictive. They make our lives a little bit difficult, because when you start thinking about a design project, well, you maybe have a project like this. You have a thought, maybe, okay, maybe I'm going to build it this way. All right, so what do I do? Okay, oh, I can't design. Maybe I will start designing with desktop in mind. Ooh, I should not design with desktop in mind first. I should go mobile first. All right, so I'm going mobile first. All right, 
which means, all right, so let me think about what I'm going to do with navigation, all right? So, you know, I have lots of navigation to put on the site, so I'm going to use the hamburger icon. Oh, wait a second, you're not allowed to use the hamburger icon because it's not cool anymore, right? Okay, so let me see what else I can do. Well, okay, I can have a data list, like a few inline links, because I don't have such a big navigation, right? So I can just put a few links in there, and then I have to put the other content somewhere on the page. But then, oh, here's a problem. Uh, mm. I should not put important stuff below the fault. Okay, so I have to put it above the fault. Okay, what, how do I do it? Well, a carousel, maybe I can kind of put things inside the carousel and then it all stays above the top. But you should not use carousel, right? So this is what it feels like to be a responsive web designer today. <laughs> right? Most of the time you really don't... It's not me, by the way. It's just... Uh, <laughs> um, it's by Espen, who is a good friend of mine. But this is actually exactly what we have to do. We think, tend to think about those patterns, and we have to do this, and we have to apply by these rules. And it's really bad to use a carousel, and it's horrible to use a parallax effect, and it's horrible to use a big video on the top. And who cares? If you create a really nice, interesting experience, maybe it's more important than creating generic experiences that we you know, see everywhere all over the place. But there is a main problem with the design process, and it's not just that design process that I keep in mind I'm talking about. Like on a global perspective, we have a big problem. The design process is weird and complicated because it involves people and organizations which often are weird and complicated. Not sure about Estonia, totally true in Germany. Like totally true in Germany, right? And this is the reason. The reason is whenever I speak to managers, they see the creative process looking like this, right? You start somewhere, as a designer, and you iterate and iterate and iterate and iterate and iterate and iterate until at some point you reach the finish line and you are finished, right? But this doesn't look like work, like creative work to me at all, because I don't look work like this at all, right? For me, it feels more like this, right? Where you start somewhere and you start exploring and you diverge and you, you know explore different directions, and at some point you might hit a good idea and then you continue evolving it, but then you might be hitting a dead end. Right? And you're exploring something else as well, and then you explore again a dead end. And this dead end is where you're losing a lot of time. Right? This is where it's really difficult to recover from. Right? So when I think about design patterns, I don't think about those trends I kind of covered in briefly. I talk about kind of common practical solutions we can use. Because they can help us recover from those time-consuming and frustrating dead ends. I think it's really, really critical. So let's take a look at some of them then. And I want to start with one that I find particularly annoying most of the time. So we tend to think about those design patterns applicable to specific parts of our interfaces. So what about talking about web forms? In fact, when I talk about web forms, this is the feeling I get most of the time. I want to kill off all of those web forms. I really don't like them, right? And if you look into them, well, there is a main fundamental problem with them. How many of you are familiar with this little toolbox? Now, this is a toolbox which was introduced by IBM in 1953 to maintain uh, type in data and use a machine, a computer, right? So it was a long time ago, but I feel like most of the time, actually many times, when we you know, fill in web forms today, it feels very much like this one. We have these archaic principles deeply engraved in our human minds. So, and I like this tweet by Mark because it kind of illustrates what, we, you know, what sticks in our heads for a while. So I keep traveling a lot, and I don't have a portable printer or scanner with me, right? But whenever I have a client wanting me to you know, get started with a project, I have to print out a document, I have to sign it, I have to scan it, and I have to fax it sometimes, or email. Do you have to fax in Estonia still? Now in Germany, you have to, apparently. So it's crazy, right? So what do I do instead? Screen grab, add digital signature, rotate slightly, add noise with Photoshop, and sent by email, right? It works like magic all the time. But why do we need to do this? I don't know, right? And it's actually still applicable to web forms. Now, this is a web form which you have to fill in if you are a non-European citizen, have to uh, want to apply for the UK visa, right? So first of all, you're greeted with other passport. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's very kind of you. I'm other passport. Uh, enter all characters exactly as they appear on my ID, including letters, numbers, and mm symbols. Why I have to type in the mm symbols is totally out of my understanding, but I actually do have to type it in, otherwise the form will not verify, right? So it's kind of weird. 
Now, this form is just bad, but there are also evil forms. And when I talk about evil forms, I talk about specifically about one company, which I dislike a lot. <laughs> right? They did a redesign, a responsive redesign. The UX is amazing, the performance is shit. Hello, everyone. <laughs> uh, it's really horrible. It takes like 12 seconds or so to, to start render. This is, un this is totally unacceptable. But the UX work is, they did is amazing. But this is an old one. And unfortunately, unfortunately, they solved everything. So I, there is no point for me to blame them, but I still have all screenshots. So um, I don't like this company. I will not call it by name, right? Um, <laughs> but there are a few things that I really dislike about them. I ran exhibit A. I looked up ferry yesterday, total of 123 pounds. Returned today, and ferry is 237 pounds. Flushed cookies, fare back to 123 pounds, right? And this is not only Ryanair doing this. So you can just clear your cookie, and then you will actually get a cheaper price. In fact, I can give you two really great tips, which have nothing to do with responsive design at all, but will literally save you money. Um, I can give you more tips tomorrow, just saying. Uh, <laughs> so the first tip is, well, first of all, if you want to screw up your company and you have to fly somewhere, always pretend that you're from Norway or from Switzerland because you'll get higher prices automatically. And the reason for that is not because they want to screw you, right? But because they have to apply prices to the specific country. Because nobody from Switzerland will, you know, will think that this is a, or an okay flight if it costs just 20 euros or so. They will just not take it seriously, right? Um, this is one thing. The other thing is, there is always, okay, two tips. Um, <laughs> there is always, uh, you know, uh, you can always get to the business lounge and first class lounge or no lounge at all, right? So we are smart, we are web developers, right? So uh, here is an idea for you. Next time you have, let's say, four or five hours to spend in an airport, go into DevTools, create an account on Lufthansa or whatever you, you are flying with, and edit the text saying from traveler to frequent traveler <laughs> or you know, first class traveler or whatever, and just you know, go to the lounge and say, well, I forgot my card with me. Um, I don't have it with me, but here is a proof that I'm a frequent traveler. They don't check. Um, <laughs> so it works for me all the time. It's really amazing. Um, <laughs> right? Um, there is another thing, so this is actually, I have no idea why I'm talking about this actually. Um, but there is also something else. So in most airports, you have a you know, counter where a person is checking your boarding pass, right? And then if it's economy, they are sending you to the right, and if it's you know, business class, they are sending you to the left or whatever. However, there is a trick you need to keep in mind. So on the left side, normally you have machines kind of where you can just scan your boarding pass, right, and get through the gate, right? Um, and on the right, there is no machine, there is just line. So try, if you're applying with economy next time, try to scan your economy pass through the uh, priority gates. It works all the time, <laughs> right? So back to responsive design. Now this is really bad, right? This is not cool. But when it comes to web forms, it's even worse. Because if you don't want to, well, uh, by, by default, when you're um, booking a Ryanair flight, you have to add insurance in, or it will be actually automatically added in for you. Um, well, unless you opt out, but you need to know how opt out, because to opt out, you need to select don't insure me, conveniently located between Denmark and Finland <laughs> in country selector, right? This is so not cool either, right? So, but they actually fix it, so that's a good thing. But we still have lots of evil forms. Most forms are not evil and not stupid, just boring. Now, this is probably one of the boring ones where you have to verify everything, including your maybe first name and last name. It's crazy, right? Um, and I tend to think that we spend way too much time thinking about those things, like input fields and select drop-downs and you know, toggles and stuff like that. Because whatever interface you have, in the end, it will all be reduced to something like this, right? Select drop-down, radio buttons, input field, a button, right? And it's boring. It doesn't matter what you do, whether it looks fancy or not, right? right? It will be boring. So we've been spending a lot of time thinking about how we can actually get rid of web forms altogether. Or how can we actually get rid of all of those things? Maybe make interface simpler, kind of make it look like an interface instead of a form. So if you look, compare this interface with this one, it's actually pretty much the same idea. You are just trying to get from one place to another, right? And you have to define the time to pick up 
and you want to order a car, right? Here it's just a matter of you know, tapping on a button, maybe twice or three times, and that's it. But it doesn't not feel as boring as this one. It doesn't feel as slow as the other one, right? And sometimes, of course, Uber tends to exaggerate. Now, this is San Francisco for you. Oh, LA. <laughs> I don't know why you need so many options, right? But you kind of get the idea. I really like this one. You can get taxi or taxi and pay $15, or taxi and pay $30 extra. Why not? Just because you can. <laughs> right? right, so this is weird. But the thing, if you think about the web form design in general, what if we actually, by default, tried very hard to move away from something like this towards something like this, right? It's actually the same interface, but here if you want to change the campaign name, well, you just tap on the campaign name and change it. You want to upload a new image, you just you know, tap on it and you upload a new image. Or you drop an image right here, or you add URL right here, right? Here, right? So while this feels a bit complex and like boredom, this feels obvious and more like progress. And in fact, there are some companies trying to do that. Typeform is one of them. The idea is to redesign the form experience by default altogether. So the idea is, well, what do you have to do when you're typing in, or when you're filling in a web form? Well, you're typing. So what, you have, what if you were focused on typing all the time? What if we removed all the other distractions? So you're not supposed to use a select dropdown. You're not supposed to use your mouse. If you want to move from one field to another, you just tap Enter. If you want to select Y or No, well, instead of using a radio button, just type uh, right Y or N, and this is how you move, right? And you can use these controls at the bottom if you need to, to move back to a previous input field or to move to the next one, right? So showing only one thing at a time, which might, think, might feel a bit, you know, doesn't, probably doesn't work for really complex and huge forms, but even for a form like a medical report, it doesn't have to be that boring, right? Um, or maybe sometimes even fun. Okay, this is not fun, but in general, it's, it's more like fun, right? That's okay. So maybe this interface, this kind of interface, could be used in large scale. In fact, Virgin, Amer uh, Virgin America are using exactly that pattern, right? Where when you're starting checking out, you actually see only one thing at a time. And it's huge, right? It's really, really huge. In fact, this is probably, if we actually can went back, this is probably one of the biggest buttons I've ever seen in my life, right? <laughs> but it's okay, because actually you see only one thing at a time, and as you move across the interface, move through the checkout, that's kind of okay, I guess. Maybe it's, this, is, this is kind of a bit weird in terms of layout, but it's okay, right? But it also kind of comes back to this idea of Okay, when it comes to web forms, we need to know what we're doing. We need to make sure that the user experience is fast, right? But this is when we also have to think about the state of mobile today. Because this is what we're dealing with today, right? Now, we have many different devices, um, but most of the time we're dealing with 4 to 5.5 inch screens. They are often high resolution screens, of course. Um, most people will be using our mobile apps or websites, unless it's games, uh, in portrait orientation and with a, with a one handed grip. Right? Meaning, this is kind of the posture. This should be a statue somewhere. Right? Um, this is kind of a posture, unless you are left-handed. Right? This is kind of the same thing. So we're not, we're, it's not that happened that we do this. Right? We are more like this on the phone. Sometimes maybe with two, two, uh, two hands, but mostly like this. Right? And of course, we tend to think, well, there are left-handed people and right-handed people, and most people are right-handed, so we should be designing for right-handed. No, 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 no. You know, sometimes your right hand is busy because you maybe, I don't know, you have a, a food or whatever in your hand, right? On the left side, then you'll be using the phone on the left side and the same side um, for left-handers, right? So we're actually using it both ways. And, um, <laughs> right, and so this is only one thing. This is only one part of the story. So kind of improving the forms. But there are also many little things we have to, we do all the time. Uh, which we right, um, which we can use in order to actually make our web forms a little bit better. So here's, for example, um, an interface example from Airbnb, right, where they're using an input type range, uh, range um, between two different you know price categories, right. But at the same time, what they're showing is an overview of what uh, options are available and which which prices, right. So the reason why they do it is to kind of avoid zero results page altogether, right? Because nobody will be actually selecting something between $9 and maybe 25 
or if they do, they should not be expecting any results in this range, right? So they're kind of showing with a little bar in the back, I don't know if you can see it in the back or not, um, kind of what options are available in here, right? Which is kind of a nice touch. The other thing is, I really don't know, I really don't understand why we have this address line 2 field everywhere. For whatever reason, it kind of found its way through all of the interfaces, making it more difficult and kind of ridiculous in some way. So it would be actually much easier to just say, okay, if you need an extra space, just click on that, you know, tap on this icon, and then you'll get an extra line. You don't need to show address line two. In fact, most people really don't know what it actually is. Uh, email is, of course, also very important. Uh, now, the most important thing about this, though, is that we actually want the right email address, right? The correct email address. Now, in order to get there, we can actually use email autocomplete, right? Um, so whenever somebody has started actually typing ads, we can suggest what options are available based on the database data we have, right? So if we know that, for example, most users are using Hotmail or Gmail, we can just actually pre-fill it or kind of suggest it some way, right? Um, and in fact, it's actually really useful to actually keep that in mind. If you want to make sure that your user is filling in the email in the correct way, just ask them to verify the email address before they click on the submit button, right? This is one little thing. Because of course we know what we tend to do most of the time. We tend, oh, great. Uh, we tend most of the time when we actually start filling in a form, uh, when we start filling in a form, we are asked to you know, type in an email address and then verify the email address. But we are smart people in the room, so what do we do? We don't retype. We're not stupid people. We copy-paste, right? So who copy-paste? Come on, I saw you, right? <laughs> Most of you. So in fact, 60% of people actually copy-paste consistently when they ask to verify the email address. If they made a mistake in the first place, they will just carry it over to the second input field altogether. So there is no, not going to be any difference, right? So there is no point to have this verify email with an asterisk. It's just pointless. So 60% of users consistently copy-paste um, which is why it's really not, in, kind of doesn't make sense to actually have it in most interfaces. Another useful thing is this placeholder thing, placeholder example. Now this is really not my day today. Uh, it quit unexpectedly on me. <laughs> oh, this is. I really don't like you, you know. <laughs> Okay, this is going to be the best. It's recorded on video. This is amazing. <laughs> all right. So, all right. Just, so. just, just no, no pressure. How many viewers do we have currently? Around a thousand viewers. That's online. great. <laughs> okay. It's going to be fun. All for the show. That's great. That's amazing. Right. So, um, yeah, one thing that really annoys me is, you know, when you go to a web form and you start filling in a form and then you have a list of countries that you have to, you know, go through, to browse through. It's maybe 330 countries or so to go through. It's so annoying. And poor Dutch people. Now, they're really, they're really suffering all the time because they really don't know what to look for. Now, should they be looking for Netherlands or the Netherlands or Holland? will be prioritized and will end up in the top 10 or top 20 or somewhere in the middle, will be in Dutch, will be in German, will be in English. How the hell do they know, right? Look at, like, you can actually look at a person from Netherlands filling in this select drop-down, country select drop-down. They spend a lot of time, every single time, oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, they spend a lot of time, every single time, trying to fill it in. That's really annoying. So instead, well, we can have a little simple uh, select drop-down here just asking the user, hey, could you please just type in the first two characters of your country? No. <laughs> I don't think there is a price difference. Um, at least I don't expect one, right? That's okay, right? All right. The other thing that's really useful if you think that, you know, select drop-down isn't mad enough. Well, very often you can do a lot with zip code alone. So you can just ask for the zip code first and then pre-fill the state and the country, and sometimes even the street, based on the zip code loan, right? Um, in fact, this is how it's done in Grace. When you just start typing your street address by starting with the zip code, for example, then it automatically completes it for you. Again, this is a really nice example of how you can minimize errors as well, right? And you can ask, well, wait a second, I don't have this data about all the streets in my country. Well, who has the data? Well, Google has, of course. 
So there is a Google Maps autocomplete JavaScript API, which has all streets of the world available for you. You can just take it and apply it right away and have autocomplete for all the streets you need. Oh, here we go. Right, Google Maps autocomplete API. Uh, another popular pattern is this credit card information uh, single input field, right? When you start typing, and then you just type your credit card number, and then at some point it slides over, and then you have a uh, date, and then you have the CVV code and the zip code all in one input field, right? That's kind of nice in a way. The problem, my problem is, well, I kind of get the idea why they slide in at this point, right? Just because of security, otherwise you see all the data at once, right? But you could actually just use asterisk for the first eight characters or so and still not make users actually go to the left and to the right to edit things, right? But it's kind of a nice pattern to keep in mind. You can try it out as well. Or maybe even something as simple as this works as well. Again, skimorphies, not skimorphies, I don't really, I really don't care. It's kind of a nice example of how you actually mimic the experience you have on the credit card. So people who don't know what CVV is can actually see it right away, right? That makes sense. Yeah, just because you can, right? Nothing practical about that. <laughs> the other thing is, well, you can also use a few buttons to, to make them feel a little bit more, you know, like buttons or like add this element of de de delight to your experience, right? Things like that, um, which we don't see a lot on the web, actually, in most interfaces. They still feel very blocky. They feel very much like forms. I would love to move away from this. It's really, really annoying. There's also one thing that's really interesting about the human mind and how we work, and it has to do with coupon fields. Now you start checking out, right? And you want to type in the coupon code, or maybe you just stumble upon the coupon code. Now, if you do have a coupon code, you're happy. But if you don't have a coupon code, well, you start Googling for a coupon code, aren't you? Who does that? <laughs> right. And then if you don't find one, you get frustrated and annoyed and disappointed, and you abandon your shopping cart. <laughs> this is uh, what research shows, sorry? Very good. I'm in Estonia. I should be expecting that. <laughs> it was a joke. Bad joke. I'm sorry. Uh, right. But this is interesting because actually what it means is when you start filling in a form um, and you don't have a coupon code, it's very unlikely that you're going to finish the checkout, which is why you should not be kind of putting coupon code fields so prominently in your checkout. But otherwise, you will have low engagement rates because people will go out and will try to find a coupon code, will not find it, and they will not check out. Which is kind of surprising, but you know, we should be hiding a coupon code. We should be kind of making it accessible, right? But we shouldn't putting, be putting it right in the face, right? Because people will not check out then. So it's better to hide a coupon link option behind the link, or behind an like, accordion, or a toggle or something. When you click on that button, you get the actual coupon field. And in fact, there is also very interesting, something very interesting about this, where people like freebies. How many people do you think will actually remove this free gift, which is just added automatically by default when you start checking out? Not many. <laughs> Not many. Even better than that, Booking.com is amazing when it comes to this. So if you are, you have to be prepared for this. This is going to change your life forever. Um, because you're going to create interfaces that are going to feel like, like amazing, seriously. So here's the deal. You're booking a, a hotel uh, night, two nights or whatever, on booking, right? And what do you have here? Well, you're booking for, okay, for one night, right? And uh, good location, whatever, whatever, whatever. And at some point, you also have breakfast included, right? Free cancellation. All right, great. So, but you have to check in for free breakfast. Yes, I would like to get breakfast for free. I just paid for it, right? But people really like clicking in these boxes, ticking these boxes, because they feel like, oh, I'm getting something for free. This is amazing. So why do you think they added it? Well, again, it boosts conversion rate, because at this point, people feel delighted. Like, wow, I'm getting so much free extra stuff. This is unbelievable, right? Although they actually paid for it. So this is all dark patterns, by the way. Don't use it. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying, no, seriously, because this is actually, um, this is a useful thing to keep in mind, right? Uh, if you want to think about conversion. Right, actually I want to talk about response design. It's a, wrong, it's a wrong deck. 
Uh, by the way, when we, when we test our web forms, we always use monkey testing. Do you know monkey testing? This guy is unbelievable. <laughs> this, you're really into this, aren't you? All right. <laughs> so monkey testing is great. So there are two things monkeys are really great at. First of all, typing in random data, and second of all, peeling in bananas, right? So when it comes to bananas, what is the right way to peel a banana? I mean, monkeys get it right. They've been doing it for many, many centuries, right? <laughs> so there is one way to, you know, from the, from the top, where, which is basically just the, uh, this dark thing at the top, right? And the root is at the bottom. So when you pile... It doesn't depend. It, there is, it's just, there is one right thing and, and wrong thing. So bananas, uh, bananas, monkeys always do it from the root, right? Yes, yes. Why are we talking about this? <laughs> So, but my monkeys are also very good at testing, right? So basically, this is a script that mimics this banana experience, uh, monkey experience. <laughs> they just type in anything, everything possible, and they click everywhere, and they fill on the data, whatever they can, everywhere, all the time, and very, very fast. So if you want to check how resilient your form is, it's a really great way of doing this, right? Because if your, your form passes this test, it passes everything, every human being, that's for sure, all right? So this is just a few rules to keep in mind. Right? Um, it's a good idea to actually prefer radio buttons, toggles, and sliders to input fields because they're just you know, uh, easier to manipulate. Hide secondary fields, floating label pattern, avoid email verification is useless, make use of the zip code, consider smart sliders, replace old country selected drop down with this when you just start typing in the uh, names, the country's uh, first sliders, and put order summary at the top. This is actually something I showed, I think. Um, because normally you have a, for example, you have a checkout again, and you have you filling in the form on the left, and on the right you have a sidebar which is with an overview of what you're buying, right? But if you just normally, as you always do, just stack things under each other, right? You have your uh, main uh, area where you actually fill in the form, and this overview will be at the bottom. But this is not convenient for users because they actually want to see what they're buying. So it's actually good to have something like a little order summary toggle, and you click on it, you get an overview of what you're buying. Right? and then have a contact form underneath. Great. <laughs> right. Um, now, there are many different ways of how to deal with tables. We covered uh, one of them. Right? Here is another one where you can just use ellipses and at some point just drop it into a data list, right? which is kind of a common thing that most people do these days. The other thing is um, maybe to try to do something entirely different. Now, in this case, what you can do, it's not playing. Mm. What you can do is actually just try to turn this little uh, table into something a little bit more convenient. Um, for example, you could visualize it, right? You can actually turn it into a chart, which means you have a table in a large view, which you're displaying by default, but you should be adding a link to maybe see this table in the graph view or in the chart view. At the same time, on the mobile, you can actually show a chart by default, allowing users to actually you know, click on a link to move to a table view as well, right? which could be quite useful. Also, these little animations or so, little delights can, be, can go a long way when it comes to responsive charts. Right? Another pattern for tables is to actually use a little uh, progress indicator. You have many, many, many columns, and one of the columns is really important. It kind of should be staying sticky. Right? You can have a little progress indicator saying, OK, I have maybe 8, 12, 15 columns. I want the user to be able to kind of move through them in steps. So at some point, if you don't, can't show everything, right, you can just say, OK, so you can just click on one of those controls, and then you can move to the next three, and then to the next three, and then to the next three. Um, you can actually look up the table saw library on Filament Group, uh, which kind of covers all of those uh, different patterns when it comes to these kind of tables. But there is one specific kind of table, which is a calendar. Right? Calendars are really difficult to tackle with. Because, I mean, if it, when it comes to tables, you can just drop some columns and allow users to select what columns they want to see. But you can't just you know, drop all Fridays in a, in a calendar 
or like drop all times between 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock. This is not how it is. The integrity of a calendar is actually what makes a table a table at this point, right? So you can't just drop columns. So what we tend to do in this case, and we actually tend to do it all the time with pretty much every major component, is we tend to look into the content of the component itself in its naked form, right? So here we've got some data in the calendar, right? And obviously it's displayed as a calendar, but if we look only at the data, we can group the content, and we can actually prioritize the content. Here we have a few highlights, right, which kind of tells us that this information is really important, but we also have different kind of content. So, uh, for example, here we have dinner time, time off, lunch, and so on and so forth. It's an interface for an application which is supposed to help managers rate and rank waiters at restaurants. So for them, it's kind of more about when somebody is available and somebody is not available, right? So you can look into the content and try to repackage it for a different context, which is going to be mobile, of course, right? So one table can become two tables, or maybe one table and a data list, right? Where you pr prioritize the important items and highlight them in a smaller overview, removing all the details, which then end up in this data list, right? So you can kind of manipulate the content to present it in a more meaningful form on mobile than you do on desktop, right? And then, of course, this part is becoming scalable, almost, almost infinitely scalable, right? Uh, another thing is calendars, right? A little calendars like this, um, kind of widgets. This is also a nice way of actually showing, kind of turning and displaying a widget, which is kind of which is pretty cool. Again, delightful, right? Another way of doing that is to actually have a little like scrolling experience where you have a smooth transition from one to another. And then when you want to select that range, this is kind of a common pattern that people are using these days, right? It also looks pretty sleek and nice. Um, not too complicated, but it's nice, right? Oh, this quit again. Unbelievable. Um, on that slide, that's pretty cool. But I don't want to see me all the time. Um, right, interesting. Okay. Uh, okay, here we go. Right, this one. So one thing that we tend to forget most of the time is it's not animated. Okay. One thing we tend to forget most of the time is, um, and you can actually check this out. Uh, now, I don't want to talk from, about this site from a political perspective, right? Um, but when it comes to technical perspective, it's amazing. It's really well done. And also from the UX perspective, it's really, really great. Now, what they do, and this is the reason why I'm showing it, is they utilize the so-called responsive upscaling. Right? We tend to think about responsive design being this technique that we use to optimize for mobile screens. Right? But this is not necessarily it. Right? Because in their case, they actually optimize for large screens as well. Right? So if you have up to you know, from maybe 2,500 pixels in width, right? what they do is they actually move this column on the right, allowing you to actually navigate through the entire sections on, uh, at the same time. So you can actually have a kind of two pages experience at the same time which is pretty cool. And most sites don't do that, right? But you can utilize available space in many, many different ways. Right. So when it comes to tables, we can prioritize what's important. We can use steppers kind of to move from one field to another. We can visualize content kind of switching between the graph view and the, ch and the table view. Uh, reposition headings. Sometimes we can actually kind of flip table on its head and stuff like this. Um, we can also adjust the level of fidelity, uh, meaning you can actually see if the mobile doesn't allow you for you know, a lot of detail in your view. You can just maybe use this assistant pattern, allowing the user to define the settings on how much it's going to be displayed, right? And then change it, um, kind of this level of fidelity depending on the screen. Um, and of course, what always works is, again, just like in the calendar example, extract the content and try to kind of repackage it in a more meaningful way. Right? Um, the other thing is iconography. Now, we tend to think that responsive design is mostly for layouts or forms or kind of fixing stuff. But it can be used for something a bit more illustrative. Uh, just because an image is scalable doesn't mean it's legible at all sizes. Most visual elements have a perfect sweet spot in terms of legibility. Icons are no different in this regard, which means 
when we start designing an icon, we always have a perfect sweet spot in mind, right? It's always about the specific dimension that this icon is designed for, right? And you don't see that icon. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> right. But what it means is that we can actually adjust the icon itself based on the viewport. Why would we do this? Now, normally, and I'm sure that you're familiar with the situation, have a company which has a manager which is re who is really strict about the way the logo should be appearing on the pages. Don't touch the logo, right? It happens to me all the time. Don't touch the logo. Um, it's really annoying because you kind of want to touch it. Right? Uh, not in that way, in a normal way. Um, so the problem is, however, well, if you just resize this logo to make it fit, kind of not occupy too much space on the mobile, well, it still is going to look really, really bad, especially if it has lots of detail. If you were just to you know, scale down this logo, well, this text will not be readable, and many of the details in here will not be readable either, right? So you can think about how can we adjust this logo to make sure that it looks great in all kind of in different views. And you can think about the thickness of the lines for example, and also the details like text, should it be appearing here or not, right? things like that. Um. <laughs> okay, uh, but it, it's really useful, especially when it comes to logos, of course, right? Um, because normally they occupy a lot of vertical space. Now, vertical space is really precious. Now, we tend to think that we can actually say, okay, if we have at most 500 pixels, that's a mobile device. But you never know, right? Because some people just use a dual view. On the right screen, they might be you know, watching a video or something. On the left, they might be working, right? So actually, having a width up to 500 pixels doesn't tell that it's a mobile device. But when it comes to height, if you can say, well, my maximum height, if my maximum height is 450 pixels, now that's a really good assumption about mobile device, because normally, People just, uh, if they are on a large screen, they will not be kind of making the height really small. Yeah, the height will be quite big, right? But the width will be quite small. So the height is actually a better indicator of a mobile device than the width. Or you can combine both and saying, if my uh, you know, device, if the width is at most 500 pixels and the height is at most 500 pixels, that's a better indicator that it's a mobile device, right? However, even small things kind of matter. So here, if I look at an accordion, Right? Where would you put the icon, and what icon would you pick? Right? You have a sub drop down, and you want to indicate that it's a uh, you know, sub drop down. <laughs> right? So, where would you put this icon? Should it be on the left, or should it be on the right? Does it make a difference? What icon would you choose? Would you choose a, uh, something like a drop down icon, or a plus icon, or a drop kind of right icon? So, who would choose, let's say, a Drop down icon. Who would choose a plus icon? Who would choose a right icon? Who would choose a left icon? Who would choose a circle? <laughs> or anything else? Anything entirely different? Right. Um, well, as it turns out, it really doesn't make a difference <laughs> <laughs> in most scenarios. So people actually get what the idea behind it is. Um, but one little thing does make a difference namely, people click on different areas. And the results are not really hugely different, but they kind of make a difference. So as it turns out, not only the actually people, I will get to it in a second, not only people click on different areas, also the task completion is different, right? And we're not talking about a few hundred milliseconds. We're actually talking about something different between 3.6 seconds and 5.2 seconds to find a navigation item in a sub drop down, which is 1.6 seconds difference. It's kind of a big difference, right? So as it turns out, with icon placed on the right, Users tend to click on the icon and not on the text, which is interesting, right? All options with icon placed on the right resulted in slower task completion. Interesting. Well, but it doesn't mean, of course, that we shouldn't be putting icons on the right, right? What it only means is if we put an icon on the right side, better make sure that it's big because people will be focusing on it, right? If you put the icon on the left, it can be pretty small, but the text should be clickable. It should have a big padding because people will be focusing on the text, right? So even details like that matter a lot, right? I also like fav icons. This is the best thing you learned today, I'm sure. This is unbelievable. So if you're on the production server, not production server, just using different, different fav icons helps to differentiate between the production and non-production. Um, 
really easily, really quickly, right? So we can simplify icons for clear appearance, save vertical space by inlining navigation, actually by adjusting the logo and putting it maybe next, uh, adjusting the, making the logo smaller and putting it on the left while putting navigation on the right. Choose large icons for critical actions, change the fab icon depending on context. How much time do I have left? 10 minutes left. You really wanted to suffer 10 more minutes. You're unbelievable. <laughs> right. Um, in general, whatever components you... <laughs> Seriously, I don't know what's going on today. Um, it doesn't matter what components you design or build. I always tend to think about it in pyramid level. What does it mean? Think about designing responsive components in terms of layering various levels of experiences and functionality. We start with a functional layer and level up to more enhanced levels for every component, for all sets of components. Which basically means when you start designing, you always think about the function first, so you kind of create this accessible, nice, you know, simple HTML. Then on top of that, you always enhance, right? And how many of you are familiar with progressive enhancement? So this is not good. Not, not, I mean, progressive enhancement is probably the critical thing when it comes to responsive design today which is a very simple foundation, which means you start with simple, clean HTML, right? And then on top of that, you're building your JavaScript layer and CSS, well, first CSS layer and then JavaScript layer, right? So even browsers that are not capable of, you know, displaying enhanced stuff can still display something. Okay, here comes a really tricky question. And don't throw tomatoes at me. So who is using React a lot? That's okay, it's a safe place. Who's using Angular? Ember? Who is not using any of those technologies because of, I don't know, reasons? <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. So the problem is, many of those technologies, they rely on JavaScript, and of course JavaScript is a good thing, it's a great technology to keep in mind, but you always need to make sure that you provide a fallback as well, right? If you rely only on JavaScript, it means that users who don't have JavaScript yet will not be able to have any experience at all. And many times when I actually you know, go to a restaurant website, which is not really a big deal, a restaurant website maybe should be two megabyte in size, 1.8 of it should be a big photo on the top, right? Um, but I mean, this should not take so much time to actually get to the content, it shouldn't be a big deal. But I often end up going to the page and seeing circles, loading indicator, loading indicator, loading indicator because, well, without JavaScript, nothing is going to happen, right? That's really annoying. We shouldn't be, we shouldn't be there. So the point is, well, if we actually start with semantic clean HTML and then build on top of that, instead of using these technologies by default, we can make resilient experiences. Um, this is not an example I wanted to show, but that's okay. Uh, Southwest. Again, this is the point where it's really important to think about vertical media queries. We tend to think about horizontal media queries, but vertical media queries can be important as well. So they, for example, use icons, and sometimes icons can be difficult to, you know, to use because they have to be, uh, just, they can't be ambiguous, right? So for example, you can't just say, I'm going to use icons everywhere, because what would be your icon for our philosophy, for example? A brain or whatever, right? You can't use it. But sometimes it kind of makes sense. But in that case, you really have to watch out for the um, vertical space, right? In that case, this menu is becoming unusable if you have more than seven or eight items, right? You can't scroll, you can't get to the last item. There is no, no way, right? It just, it's just impossible. So a simple way to fix it would be to actually analyze how much space you have vertically, right? And then add a more plus tab or accordion or whatever when you can't display everything, right? At least to keep everything accessible then. This is an example from a BMW website where this is exactly the problem they had, where they had to make sure that this more button is always visible, right? Always visible. That was really, really critical for them. So they still have a lot of other things and they have uh, the auto um, picture of the car in here, right? But it's really important to track how much space you have horizontal or vertically, and then make sure that more is always available. So people click on more, then they get all the other options. Right. And this is also what um, Wikipedia does, for example, where they also use um, vertical media queries to track what to display and how. Right. So by default, everything is displayed. Right. 
But then if you can't, if they assume that you're on a mobile device, they want to allow you to actually jump between areas in a more comfortable way, they turn the sections into an accordion, right? Um, the other thing is how to deal with things like really complex things, like graphs or charts or maps, right? In that case, you will need a library. There is no other way. Like if you have a complex kind of complex interactions like this one, you cannot you cannot get away with just a simple you know I'll, I'll do it whenever I need way. You have to actually make sure that you have a library for this to make sure that it's actually readable, because you might need to change the fidelity. Again, here you can see the numbers, for example, which are clickable, right? But it wouldn't make sense to make them clickable here, right? Because it, the, there is no space for it. Um, here's also another example of how you can deal with maps, uh, where basically instead of actually forcing the user to select a specific country where they want to go to, at which you know, is served as a filter, you can s let them select several countries, right, and then show up a data list allowing them to select that one country which actually is in this selection, right? So you allow them to select several countries, And then when they click on it, they can actually select what country exactly they meant. Right? It's a little thing that can, be, can make the uh, experience a little bit better. This is an example I meant um, about the map. Right? On a small screen, you can just show an image of the map. On a large screen, you can actually turn it into an iframe. Right? This is a fantastic uh, light box experience. I can actually watch it all day long. Right? I don't know why it exists in so many places. It's so annoying, right? Uh, and Facebook knows that they shouldn't be doing this, right? So, for example, on Facebook, if you don't have space to show a light box, they don't show a light box. They actually bring you to the next page, right? But if you do have a space to show a light box, well, they're going to show you a light box. Kind of makes sense, too. And the last thing I want to show you probably is a carousel. Now, I know that we think that carousels are bad and nasty and dead and we shouldn't be using them, right? said one person in the room, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Well, carousels are kind of annoying at times, but if I ask you, what, what would be a reason for me to click here or here on one of those dots in this carousel? Can you answer me? Why should I click there? What is the point? You really like answering questions, don't you? <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, maybe you actually want to know what, you know what this guy looks like on a horse or whatever. I don't know. Maybe you do, but maybe I don't. Right? Maybe I don't care. There is really no point. There is no context for me. I don't know why I should be clicking there. Right? Um, in fact, many carousels are designed in a really bad way. This is probably the, the best, worst example I've ever seen in my life. So this is a carousel, and these are the only controls to control it. I hope it's really small for you <laughs> in the back, right? This is, this is like human suffering. This is, this is bad. This is really, really bad, right? Why do you do it this way, right? Um, and many you know, designers are really kind of in agreement about whether we should or should not be using a carousel. Kind of this answer is conveniently presented as a carousel. Uh, why not, right? And it's all based on one study. Where they analyzed how much people spend on seeing the image one, image two, image three, image four, image five in a carousel. Now, the results are not very surprising. <laughs> so, how many people see image one? Well, probably almost everybody, right? Unless they're liars, right? Um, position two, 3%. Position three, 3%. Position four, 3%. Position five, 3%. What does it mean? Out of 100 people, there are always 100 uh, free weirdos clicking everywhere, right? <laughs> they click just everywhere all the time. It's like monkeys, they click everywhere, right? <laughs> But most people don't, right? So one could say, okay, so what do we do now with the carousel? Well, oh, we have an idea. Let's make a random image, right? Then kind of everybody will see image in pretty much the same amount of time. This is stupid. No, this is seriously stupid because that means that at this point, one image is going to get uh, you know, 80% or whatever, 85%, and the others will not. And then somebody evil comes and says, I know what. We're not going to just display it randomly. We're going to animate it. So everybody is forced to see everything. Right? Oh. <laughs> right? Um, well, yeah, the conversion rate will increase, of course. Um, the problem is whether people will be happy with it or not. 
Um, so Amazon decided to change it. So they used to have this traditional carousel, right, which, they, you, know, which you know probably. Uh, and they decided to actually kind of uh, look into how they can improve it and how, how it would re reflect, in re in, um, reflect in the conversion rates. So this is the carousel they decided to go with. Right? So this is a design. You have a big prominent image at the, top, at the back where they kind of show a deal of the day. Right? And then you have a few little boxes, five of them, with a thumbnail and a text description of, description of that box. Right? Now, they didn't share any numbers, obviously. Um, but they were actually uh, acknowledged in an interview that it was really, really uh, important for them to move to this design because it significantly boosted the performance of their sales, right? which is why they're rolling it out on every single category page now. It right? doesn't mean that if it worked for them, it will work for you, right? but this is a way better carousel than the previous one. I think that we all agree with this. Right? Ironically, they still use the old carousel as well. <laughs> which is kind of cute in a way, right? But I guess this is a different um, kind of situation. I mean, at this point, you just want to maybe really roll through your items, right? It's kind of a different story. Uh, this is the last one. Um, and in fact, you can actually think about many details. So here's an interesting example of how Carousel can look entirely different, right? So this is, I think, housing.com, and they have this kind of experience. You want to rent a room, so you go to the page, and then you have a gallery, right? And you move from one one picture to another, right? And as it turned out in the studies, well, the more people interact with the photos, the more likely they are to actually rent something on their site. It's kind of an interesting metric to keep in mind. So for them, it was really important to keep people engaged with kind of interacting with the photos. But how would they do that, right? Carousel wasn't performing well enough. They decided to kind of change it. And this is the experience they went for. As you scroll down, um, as you see previously, they were scrolling horizontally. Right? Now, if you just scroll vertically, well, you're just getting picture, 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 picture. You're kind of forced, forced to see the pictures, unless you actually click on the price. If you click on a tab on this area, it kind of pops up, and you interact with the information about what the you know, apartment is about and stuff like this. Right? And they kind of make people make a conscious decision. Do you want to kind of go to the pictures, or do you want to go to this information? Right? And it was really remarkable to see the results, uh, quite remarkable, um, which is kind of repackaging the carousel experience as, as how they called it, right? Everything went up. Photo engagement went up. Shortlist conversion went up. Phone call conversion went up. Request call by conversion went up. Everything went up. And when, the, when you ask them what, so what, was the, what was the experience, well, we feel that images create a story you can never create with stats, number, or text. Gently present the various options you have to your users. Make them damn simple to access, right? Which kind of makes sense. Obviously, it's a very simple thing to keep in mind. And they published an article about designing photo stories. Again, really repackaging this carousel experience altogether. It doesn't have to you know, look like a carousel. Itself, per se, carousel is not a bad pattern, right? It's just the way we design it, which really matters, right? OK, so let me just go to the conclusion slide. This is going to be my conclusion slide. <laughs> um, so we kind of went through a few different things today. Um, unexpectedly, through a few things I didn't want to cover at all, right? But I think that you kind of get a few ideas about what you can do, what you can't, shouldn't do, maybe, um, when you're building or designing the next responsive site. And tomorrow, luckily, if we manage to fix it, we're going to talk a bit more about workflow and pattern libraries and uh, performance and front end and stuff. So this is going to be fun. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm not going anywhere. So please feel free to come to me anytime. I just hope that using some of the techniques we covered, you can make, actually build up nice, beautiful, shiny, responsive experiences that will actually stand the test of time. That will be great. Thank you.